Thank you, Prospect family. Welcome to RTB 2021 for June the 24th, 2021. Hope you're doing well this day. So we have uh, some interesting texts once again. We've got Deuteronomy 29, uh, Psalm 119 again. We're uh, going up through verse, I think 20, I'm sorry, uh, 24 more verses. So verse 49 through 72. Uh, then we have Isaiah 56, starting a new section in the book of Isaiah, uh, last section in the book of Isaiah, and then finally Matthew chapter 4. So let's jump right on into Deuteronomy 29. Uh, so Deuteronomy 29 is also starting a, a next section in the book of Deuteronomy. So uh, really from the end of chapter 4 in Deuteronomy all the way up through chapter 28 has been uh, the, uh, the, the a primary list of of, uh, I guess, covenant prescriptions. And then of course, in 27 and 28, we had the, the covenant enforcements, uh, the blessings and cursing. So five, probably five through 26 were the uh, list of prescriptions, a uh, sermon on the part of Moses. Uh, and now, uh, and also part of that sermon was uh, chapters 27 and 28, but also all in the context of this kind of a structure of an ancient Near Eastern treaty document, which shows, I think, uh, something of what Moses was trying to communicate, which of course is that idea of the fact that God is in a covenant relationship with his people, and this is what it looks like. And then in chapter 29 and 30, we're going to have uh, uh, a kind of a reiteration of the covenant uh, at Moab. So this is getting um, a, a restatement, I guess you could say, of, of some of the main points that Moses uh, was trying to uh, trying to to get across to the people um, and probably one of the most important points that he's getting across is this is not just a covenant for them uh, this is a covenant for every succeeding generation of, of Israelites uh, so if you read down uh, starting in verse um, let's see we'll start with verse eight I'm sorry verse nine so keep the words of this covenant and do them that you may prosper in all that you do uh, you stand today, all of you, before the Lord your God, your chiefs, your tribes, your elders, your officers, even all the men of Israel, the little ones, your wives, uh, and and all those uh, that uh, that you may enter into a covenant with the Lord your God and into the oath which the Lord your God is making with you to that day, uh, in order that he may establish you today as his people, uh, and that he, he may be your God just as he spoke to you as he swore to your fathers. Uh, now, not with you alone am I making this covenant or this oath, but with both those who stand with us here today in the presence of the Lord and with those who are not here today. Uh, and so the importance for Israel is not just keeping the covenant in that day and age, uh, the day when they're about to go into the promised land, uh, even as they are reiterating, Moses reiterating that covenant with them uh, at Moab, but uh, in the plains of Moab but for every subsequent generation. Um, and, and that will be, ultimately will be the key uh, to whether or not Israel would maintain their fidelity to God in the future. Will, will uh, parents and grandparents especially uh, within the covenant community of faith pass on uh, their, the, the knowledge of this covenant and God's deeds for his covenant people to those subsequent generations and will those subsequent generations have ears to hear and eyes to see uh, and a heart to, to know, as he says in verse four, um, these things? So that was the question. We'll find out how they do when we get to uh, Joshua and Judges. Moving on to Psalm 119, once again. Psalm 119, starting with verse 49. So this is a section, you probably notice this uh, at the top of the that section starts with the, the word Zion, which is the Hebrew letter Z, uh, makes the Z sound, Zion. Um, and, uh, and one of the most common words that's associated with Zion is Zakar, which is to remember. And so we have three times in this text where it talks about remembering. Uh, there's the prayer the psalmist asks uh, for... for uh, God, to remember the word to your servant, um, which you have, and which you have made me to, to hope. Uh, verse 52, I have remembered your ordinances from of old, uh, O Lord, and comfort myself. And then finally, verse 55, 
O Lord, I remember your name in the night and keep your law. Now, remember, remembering is not just calling something to mind, but it's calling something to mind in order to act on it. It's not forgetting something, but it's calling it to mind for the purpose of acting on it. So when the psalmist prays uh, that uh, God will remember his word to his servant, uh, in which you have made me hope, um, he's praying that, that, that God would remember his promises given to him. And when he states that he has remembered your ordinances from old, it's not just it's not just a head knowledge, but it's calling them to mind in order to act on them. Um, and same thing with verse 55. Uh, another thing that, that I noticed in this, this text is uh, the idea in uh, verses 65 and following of this idea of affliction and the role affliction has in the life of the, uh, the member of the covenant community of faith uh, as it regards the word of God. Uh, he says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, uh, but now I keep your uh, word. Uh, in other words, um, without the affliction, he wasn't keeping, uh, he wasn't keeping his word. Um, but now, verse 71, it was good for me that I was afflicted that I may learn your statutes. So his affliction actually had a role to play uh, in, uh, in understanding and learning. Uh, the word of God and applying it to applying to, to his life. So interesting section there in, in Psalm 119. Let's move on to Isaiah 56, starting a new section, as I mentioned, in Isaiah 56. Uh, has a little bit of a different focus than Isaiah 40 through 55. Um, and it has uh, some, some um, focuses, especially a different focus as regards the, the Messiah, kind of as this... Um, as this uh, glorious uh, king and conqueror, um, and a universal one at that. And it starts out in verse in chapter 56 here uh, with this promise that, uh, that not only will, um, will the restoration of God be for his people, uh, not only are they the ones who will be coming to worship uh, God, but also it will be, um, it'll be the foreigner. And those previously excluded from the covenant community of faith. Verse 6 is a great verse to, that speaks of this. Also the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord your God, um, to be his servants even. Every one of them who keeps from profaning, profaning the Sabbath and who holds fast my covenant. So he's looking forward to a day in which, uh, and this is something that Isaiah has really done throughout his book, uh, where when God restores his people, it will be a restoration that encompasses the entirety of the world. And, um, and it, you have here this, this uh, verse, uh, verse 7, which of course is the verse that Jesus quotes uh, when he cleanses the temple, that my house will be a house of prayer for all people. So when Jesus comes and cleanses the temple, he's, he's uh condemning the, the Jewish leaders of the day by saying that they have become like the den of thieves, the, the, the people who led the people of Israel into exile in the first place. Uh, but God's temple, which I think he, when he clears the temple, he's kind of saying that he's the new temple. Uh, he's the, the, uh, the presence of God among his people, the rule of God among his people. When he does that, uh, Jesus is basically uh, saying that that uh, he is the means by which um, God uh, will become a, uh, a, a, a way of drawing peoples from all nations uh, to himself. It's through Jesus when, where that will happen. So that's Isaiah 56. And that brings us to Matthew 4. And again, I've talked about these before. So if you go, want to go back to, to January 4th, you can uh, check out some of those verses or my discussions on those verses. Uh, but in Matthew 4, uh, we have the, the discussion of, or the, uh, the account of Matthew, of the temptation of Jesus, also uh, Jesus beginning his ministry, uh, then the first disciples being called, and then Jesus uh, ministering in Galilee, where he called his first disciples. But of course, the temptation of Jesus was a very significant event, and Matthew, I think, sees this as a way to identify to us who Jesus is, what his identity was. And he is the new Israel uh, in fulfillment uh, of what Israel should have been. 
And um, so Jesus has tempted them three ways. Uh, he's tempted uh, with this, uh, with, with the, the stones uh, into bread. He's tempted because he is hungry, right? Um, tempted with these, this, this physical need that he has. He's tempted to, um, to take God's protection for granted uh, in verse 6. And he's tempted ultimately to uh, worship something other than God himself. And guess what? In all three ways, it, for Israel in the wilderness, after the Exodus, Israel was tempted in each of those three ways. Tempted by, uh, you know, this, this lack of food. Tempted to take God's protection for granted. Tempted to uh, worship other things than God himself. Uh, and they failed, frankly, as you read through that account. But Jesus succeeds. And how does he succeed? He succeeds by, by holding fast to the word of God found in Deuteronomy. Again, he's quoting all three times in answer to Satan uh, from the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, the covenant document, right? He is the one who's fulfilling all righteousness, even as Israel should have fulfilled all righteousness. Uh, he's the one who is then the new people of God. And if you want to be part of the new people of God, if you want to be part of Israel, you become part of Jesus because he is now the representative of Jesus. And, and Matthew gets at that even further as he quotes from Isaiah 9 in the first part of Jesus's ministry uh, in verse 15 and 16. Uh, this is the Isaiah 9 passage that speaks of a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. This is the first part of that chapter. Uh, and it's, of course, looking forward to a king that's going to be born uh, and he will be um, called eternal father, prince of peace, right? And he will rule with righteousness. In other words, he's saying that Jesus is that king uh, who represents all of God's people rightly before him. He does what Israel could not do. Uh, and so Matthew is identifying Jesus at the very beginning of his ministry uh, as that fulfillment of the Old Testament the, the uh, fulfillment of Israel, uh, uh, the real role of Israel to be a light to the nations, a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. And uh, we can be part of that because we are part of Jesus. And Jesus represents us before God rightly. Uh, then he calls these 12 disciples, right? Uh, he calls, well, he calls his first disciples, but ultimately he will call the, the, the totality of the 12 because he's forming a new people of God, right? 12 disciples, 12 tribes. Uh, so much of what we find here in Matthew is, is a showing of who Jesus is, identifying who he is. Uh, and what is our role? Well, our role is to be like these disciples, uh, to follow him and to be fishers of men. Uh, that's our, that's the, the role that has uh, that is modeled for us to be part of the people of God, we, we, uh, we do those things. And uh, that's a good exhortation for us uh, even uh, this day. On this day, June the 24th, 2024, 2021, I always do that. June the 24th, 2021, hope you're doing well and hope you have a great rest of the day.